Good afternoon, um, everybody. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to um, today's um, ICCD uh, briefing um, on uh, gender and violent extremism today. My name is Johan Korps. I am the director of the Institute of Security and Global Affairs um, at the University of Leiden here in the, the Hague, and also professor of security studies. And in this um, uh, event today, also wearing my second hat, which is a board member of the board of the uh, International Center for Counter Terrorism. Very well, well, welcome to everyone. We have a uh, jam-packed program. In the next hour, we will have four excellent speakers that will give us different di dimensions and their perspectives into um, today's topic. Uh, those speakers are Dr. Joanna Cook, who is a program manager at ICCT, um, freshly joining both ICCT and the Institute of Security and Global Affairs. She joined a, a week ago from King's College London. She's also the editor-in-chief of the ICCT Journal and assistant professor of terrorism and political violence in the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs. We have um, Dr. Alexander Deer, who's the gender coordinator at the United Nations Security Council Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, CTED. Um, Ashley Matthijs, uh, who's a PhD candidate in the Department of Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a doctoral fellow with the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. And we have, uh, last but not least, Dr. Yannick Rayou-Lepage, who is an assistant professor at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden um, University. Now for today's uh, event, um, this is the second live webinar of ICCT today, um, co-organized together with the Institute of Security and Global Affairs. Um, both institutions have a very strong relationship. Um, uh, ISRA is um, one of the uh, founding institutions of ICCT, together with um, Klingendal and um, the um, ASA Institute. And ICCT, for those of you um, who are not yet familiar with it, uh, is an independent think and do tank. So uh, both it does both uh, extensive research on the topic of uh, counter-terrorism and countering violent extremism, but also a lot of advice, uh, evidence-based policy advice, practical on the ground solutions um, on all aspects that relate to the prevention of uh, terrorism and violent extremism and also strengthening the rule of law. Um, the Institute of Security and Global Affairs as a partner institution of the ICCT um, focuses on a variety of security and global affairs issues. Uh, one of them a strong research group is the um, terrorism and political violence research group, where also um, a lot of today's speakers are coming from, and also where a lot of joint work is done on a variety of issues of um, um, extremism, violence, and terrorism. Also, I should uh, mention that today um, a new ICCT publication is being released by ICCT director Renske van der Weer on incels um, and there are also a variety of other publications that might be of interest for you from ICCT on the women's roles in the Islamic State um, or online misogyny and far-right violence um, and also a variety of uh, questions relating to gender and violent extremism. Very briefly now before we start and I hand over to the panelists um, just explaining how this works uh, in, in, the, in the form of some housekeeping ru uh, rules. There will be a um, presentation of about 12 minutes by each speaker. Um, then there will be an opportunity uh, of around half an hour for questions and answers from the audience, so to say, after the panelists have spoken. If you would like to ask a question, um, please do so by sending an uh, email uh, or using the email address media at icct.nl. So media at um, uh, icc dot nl and these questions will be fed to me then and I can then ask them to the panelists um, after they've spoken and I hope we will have a, um, a very good and lively Q&A session that can also then bring some interaction to this. Uh, also there will be a recording of this webinar uh, and live session there which you can later on um, download, um, uh, sorry, uh, view and on, on I think YouTube and different platforms um, and also what we would like to do, 
um, in fact, is to uh, improve our sessions um, from occasion to occasion. So we will also send out to registered participants a um, short feedback survey afterwards um, and that will be uh, that will be popping up on your screen when you leave this brief. So thank you very much for um, following also um, those instructions and without further ado I would like to uh, hand over to our first speaker, um, Dua Jana um, Cook. Uh, as I already introduced her, she is both at ICT and ISRA, joined recently. In her research she focuses on women and gender and violent extremism, countering violent extremism and counterterrorism practices. Um, she also recently published a book with OUP on that topic on gender and extremism. Um, and she also has scholarly interest, of course, in non-state actors and pathways and factors towards radicalization. Her presentation is titled Gender Dynamics in ISIS in relation to the roles of women, as well as implications of the gender lens for counterterrorism efforts. Um, please, Joanna, over to you. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, just making sure this is coming through. Sorry about that. A big thanks ICT for hosting today's webinar and for uh, Joheen for chairing the event. This is my first uh, event uh, in my new role with ICT and Leiden University, and it's such a pleasure to be on this panel. I've known and admired uh, Yannick, Ashley, and Alexander's work for quite some time. So in my very brief presentation today, uh, I'm going to discuss some work I've done on women in counterterrorism from my recent book, A Woman's Place, U.S. Counterterrorism Since 9-11. Uh, so it should just be on the first slide there. Uh, in the book, I look at full spectrum international U.S. counterterrorism efforts between 2001 and early 2019 and investigate how women have become visible in the discourses and practices of counterterrorism as agents, partners, and targets. In the book, I look at the Department of Defense, State Department, and USAID. A couple quick definitional points. When I discuss full spectrum counterterrorism, this encompasses both direct and indirect approaches that is preventing and countering violent extremist work through to political approaches, law enforcement and military means. So any activity that is really defined as having a direct or indirect contribution to countering terrorism. By agents, I mean women working within the US government as soldiers, diplomats, aid workers and so forth. And by partners, I mean women in foreign countries such as Iraq, Afghanistan or Yemen that the US works with through foreign governments such, uh, or otherwise en engages as communities of interest. So this can include women in community organizations, the US supported or women directly engaged or trained in their programming. By targets, I mean women who are actually members and supporters of these terror groups, particularly Al Qaeda and ISIS. So the scope for analyzing women through a gender lens as applied to these roles in counterterrorism is vast and broad. And these roles are just a snapshot of those related to this field. Examining the 18 years highlighted to me what uh, significant gaps in knowledge, policy and practice there have been and that there, there continue to be in relation to women, gender, and counterterrorism. So by not fully understanding, supporting, or recognizing women's roles in relation to counterterrorism and the gender dynamics within these has led to flawed or problematic policies and practices. Yet there were also many positive steps seen in this period and lessons that can be carried forward today, particularly as we face new concerns today, including those from the far right, for example. And so the book uh, demonstrates it's absolutely imperative to meaningfully and engage uh, and consider women specifically and gender dynamics more broadly at every step. Women's participation, engagement, and consideration matters to counterterrorism. It impacts the efficiency of these practices and ensures that they reflect the needs and considerations of women in that society, also emphasizing a human rights compliant approach to counterterrorism, which does not, in fact, violate their rights unintentionally or reinforce gendered biases or stereotypes. There are two themes I will discuss today gendered roles associated with women in counterterrorism and those of women in Al Qaeda and ISIS. Slide. Oh, there we go. When we talk about women in counterterrorism policy and practice, whether as agents, partners, or targets, these policies and practices are almost always influenced by gendered assumptions and understandings. 
They can be based on things such as idealized gendered roles and assumptions of men and women in that space, ideas of what a so-called woman's place is in relation to counterterrorism and their roles in terrorist groups. These discourses and practices can either challenge or reinforce stereotypes. For example, the idea that men may be more efficient soldiers on the front lines or women more astute intel analysts, that women are not generally community or religious figures to partner with, or that mothers versus fathers are better positioned in the family to counter violent extremism. But by recognizing all these discourses and practices are gendered, it does help us identify, question and challenge assumptions to ensure the most efficient, fair and legitimate approaches to countering terrorism are taken. In the book, I dive into many examples and created a framework for analyzing women in relation to counterterrorism. Specifically, there were three elements I look at in this framework. The categories women were discussed in as related to counterterrorism, factors that influence the evolution of discourses and practices related to women, and justifications stated to explain why women should be engaged in counterterrorism efforts. I'll briefly discuss a couple examples of these from the book. But what these categories, factors, and justifications offer is a framework or a map for better identifying how, where, and why women have been emphasized in relation to US counterterrorism, as well as the reasons this may have changed or been encouraged in the first place. It is a transferable framework that can also be applied to other countries. So women were generally referenced in one of seven general categories in relation to US counterterrorism efforts. These included, for example, women as security practitioners, the most frequently referenced category for obvious reasons. And this encompassed women's formal roles in the armed forces, police, intelligence services, and other related roles. But this considered uh, unique all women's units, as such as team lioness, female engagement teams, or those supported in foreign forces, such as all female elite counterterrorism units in Yemen, or the daughters of Iraq or sisters of Fallujah programs in Iraq, programs that are still often overlooked in research. Another category considered women's victimhood, which emphasized women as victims in several senses, noting deficits in women's rights, highlighting women's oppression, or women are seen as an indicator of broader challenges or shortfalls in a society that was more susceptible to extremist appeals. It also considered women as victims largely targeted by terrorist violence, specifically sexual and gender-based violence is seen largely with Yazidis and other local women who suffered under ISIS. In some cases, saving women was also used to justify or promote certain counterterrorism practices. These categories evolved significantly over this period as largely influenced by eight key factors. So one of these factors was the evolving operational objectives prompted by the environments the US were operating within and the strategy, mission, or program at hand. None of these environments was static and the situation on the ground in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Yemen all changed substantially during the global war on terror prompting evolving operational objectives. So how, where, and why women were engaged was directly tied to that operational objective of the day, as well as the understood means with which to achieve it. For example, as more limited missions began evolving into full-blown counterinsurgency operations as seen in Afghanistan and then Iraq. Another factor was the department or agency's own historical knowledge, consideration of, and emphasis on women and gender in their work. Women tended to be considered more in evolving counterterrorism programming when they'd been explicitly or frequently mentioned in policy language or when gender was considered in agency planning, frameworks, and evaluation. This also considered the presence of things like gender advisors, gender coordinators, or other roles where women and gender concerns were prioritized, and what level of support, influence, or access these had. This institutional level, in particular, brings important and often overlooked perspectives to this field. And finally, we saw three prominent discourses frequently referenced to justify how and why women should be engaged in counterterrorism efforts. And these proved important for understanding the different motivations for including women by each agency or department. One justification frequently cited was the perceived operational benefits, innovation, and effectiveness achieved by including women in counterterrorism related initiatives. Another was the half the population approach where women's inclusion was justified by virtue of their representing 50% of the population. And this suggested that gender as a social construct shaped the roles and experiences of men and women in that society differently. And women could therefore bring unique perspectives, ideas or experiences to the table. So this is a quick look at the framework developed for analyzing women in counterterrorism discourses and practices. Next slide. 
In analyzing the topic of women and terrorism, I take an approach promoted by both Krellenstein and Gentry and Schoberg that highlights how we understand terrorism has a significant impact on how it is countered, and thus on the programs, resources, institutional time and efforts utilized for these. It is important then that as we identify how women and gender have been increasingly considered and engaged in counterterrorism, that their diverse roles in terrorist groups also be examined as well. In the book, I also examine the discourses and practices of both Al-Qaeda and ISIS then. I want to expand on this a bit to emphasize my second point in the presentation, why a gender lens matters when looking at violent extremist groups. It is our understanding of these organizations and their ideology, strategies, tactics and objectives that inform who is attracted to these groups and how diverse responses to them are devised and conducted. This includes identifying gendered assumptions about women's roles in terrorist groups and considering the implications of these for efforts to counter these groups. One of the things in the book that was noteworthy was that when contrasting US counterterrorism discourses related to women, there were many instances where these discourses and their interrelated debates, in fact, largely mirrored those of non-state actors though in clearly different contexts. For example, both in the US and in Al-Qaeda and ISIS, there were debates about women's roles as security actors, whether women should be on the front lines of combat or in uh, jihadist combat operations. Groups like ISIS too would emphasize things like women's victimization in their propaganda, highlighting topics such as the Niqab ban, cases of rape or murder of local women by US soldiers in Iraq, as with Abir al-Janabi, or death of Muslim women and human rights violations in conflict zones. Women's operational roles evolved significantly over this period as well, with branches like Al-Qaeda in Iraq actively utilizing female suicide bombers, with ISIS largely relegating women to the domestic sphere and minimally using females in suicide operations in limited circumstances, but often again based on evolving operational environments. Uh, next slide. The status of families of ISIS fighters also remains timely and is influenced by gendered assumptions. In 2019, me and my former colleague at ICSR, Gina Vale, updated the first global data set of women, minors, and total populations who joined ISIS from 80 countries. And we noted a number of important things. First, that of all these countries, women were only accounted for in almost half of these, barely half. The rest did not have any publicly accessible figures available but even then, women counted for around 16% of foreigners in Iraq and Syria. When we look at terrorist groups today, unless women are on the front lines of battle or the ones carrying the weapons, they still tend to be overlooked, which means we still don't fully understand these groups and their related members. And this really limits preventative, interdiction, and responsive measures related to them. And many of these women took up Islamic State calls to bear children and raise the next generation, some having multiple children in the war zone, creating what it we're facing today as a near crisis in terms of managing this growing and complex population. Women and their children now represent the majority of foreigners in Iraq and Syria and face the brunt of international opinion of the group. In El Hall camp, women and minors account for 10,000 foreigners remaining in the camp as of May this year. 7,000 of these are children, many under the age of five as they've been born over in the theater. This issue will not just dissipate and many of these adults have not faced prosecution, de-radicalization or rehabilitation and children remain victims of their parents' choices and home country neglect. Women have also been at the heart of many debates around the stripping of citizenship, including Shamima Bagum, one of the Bethnal Green girls who traveled when she was a teenager. The repatriation, rehabilitation and prosecution of women has also varied country to country, depending on the gendered view of women. In some countries, women are being prosecuted with terrorism-related charges, as seen in countries like France and Germany, while others, in others they are largely being returned to their homes without any due prosecution. As Alexander and Turkington have noted, gendered assumptions and prosecutions of women are rife. Gendered assumptions at a country and institutional level, amongst others, are key to these diverse approaches in dealing with this very complex population. Uh, next slide. In short, and in this very brief presentation, I hope that it's highlighted that a gender lens really matters when we look at counterterrorism and terrorism today, and particularly those related to the diverse roles of women. And until we fully integrate a gender conscious lens in all of this work, we will continue to have limited or flawed practices and not fully understand these groups and their tactics, objectives, strategies, and ideologies. I'll leave it at this for now, but I'm happy to discuss any of the points in the Q&A following. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. That kicked us off very nicely on the role of gender in 
um, extreme violence and counterterrorism. Next um, presentation with the title, The Integration of Gender Perspectives Across CTEDs, the um, uh, Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee Executive Director's mandate, including its dialogue with member states, analysis of the latest trends and developments in counterterrorism and uh, CVE, and engagement of the civil society and the research community. This presentation will be presented by Dr. Alexander. Alexandra Deer, uh, who is the gender coordinator at the CTED. Uh, in this role, she is also responsible for ensuring the integration of gender perspectives um, across CTED's mandate, including in its dialogue with member states. Um, and in that, she also, of course, looks at um, developments in counterterrorism and CTE and engagement with civil society and the research community. Alexandra, over to you. There we go. Uh, thank you so much. So it's a real pleasure to, to be part of, um, of the discussion today and thank you so much for ICCT, um, uh, for ICCT organizing this um, and it's also wonderful to see that we have uh, so many participants online um, today. So um, what I want to uh, focus on in, uh, in my remarks is um, the the intersection of research and uh, and policy, and uh, reflect on how um, how in the policy space we are integrating gender into countering terrorism and violent extremism, and how that relates to um, two findings uh, from uh, from research. And the research has, of course, grown exponentially in in recent years, and is um, becoming ever more diverse and addressing different facets of gender and how it relates to uh, violent extremism and countering it. And this panel is a, is a good example uh, of the, the very diverse directions in which this re research ag agenda uh, continues to evolve. And this diversity of, of perspectives and areas of focus um, shows that gender is, is not a single issue. It is, um, it is rather a, a cross-cutting perspective and an analytical lens without which political violence and terrorism, uh, its underlying factors and different manifestations uh, cannot be fully understood and without which the necessary responses to these phenomena cannot be adequately developed. So turning to the policy space and the international framework, um, what we are experiencing um, at, at the moment is that on the one hand, there is an unprecedented political backlash against the women, peace and security agenda and women's rights. Um, and on the other hand, we are also seeing progress, including in counterterrorism, when it comes to acknowledging the importance of gender and the necessity of adopting more gender sensitive approaches in our policies. So let me focus for just a brief moment on uh, what we are seeing in this regard at the UN Security Council. Um, as many of you will know, of course, the uh, WPS agenda has been around since, um, since the year 2000. But it was not until about 2014-15 that the issue of gender began to also be integrated into the Council's counterterrorism work. And Resolution 2242, which was adopted in October 2015, was a milestone in this regard. That resolution specifically called for the greater integration by both member states and UN agencies of their agendas on uh, women, peace and security on the one hand and counterterrorism and countering violent extremism on the other hand. And that resolution also requested uh, CTED to integrate gender as a cross-cutting issue throughout all of our activities. Since then, subsequent resolutions have addressed different gender factors um, with regard to, for example, the linkages between human trafficking, sexual violence and terrorism, and the importance of gender in developing counter narratives. Uh, resolution 2396 um, addressed the issue of returning foreign terrorist fighters and recognized the diverse roles that women play in relation to terrorism, both as victims as well as supporters, facilitators, and perpetrators of terrorist acts. And that resolution requested member states to develop gender sensitive prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration strategies for women returning from terrorist groups. In addition to Security Council resolutions, the importance of women's participation and leadership in CVE and PV efforts is also recognized in the Global Counterterrorism Strategy and in the Secretary General's plans, uh, plan of action on PVE. There are also regional and national examples of strategies and action plans 
both on PCVE and on women, peace and security that incorporate language on the intersection of gender and violent extremism. And while the nature of, of, of that language uh, itself certainly merits further analysis and discussion, the question that I want to address or focus on here is what challenges we are seeing in the implementation of these international commitments at the strategic and rhetorical level when it comes to an actual policy practice. Next slide, please. And I want to zoom in on uh, four key challenges that I currently see with regard to the implementation of gender perspectives in counterterrorism practice. And that is um, the uneven implementation across the counterterrorism spectrum, the fact that gender does not equal women, the lack of impact evaluations and guidance, and finally, I want to say a few words about the impact of COVID-19. Next slide. So the first uh, issue that I want to focus on is the uneven implementation across the counterterrorism and CBE spectrum. So what we're seeing is um, very much a disproportionate focus on PCBE initiative um, and the engagement of, of women in that context. Um, and there's only very little attention that is being devoted to integrate gender more fully across the counterterrorism spectrum. Um, and I think it is important for gender not to be siloed in that way and not for it to, to be confined to the CVE space. Um, it's important that gender is not just a matter for, for civil society, uh, even though there is a lot of engagement of, of women in, in that space. Um, and it is important that it's not just seen as, as a so-called soft issue. Um, gender perspectives are highly relevant to criminal justice responses, uh, to countering terrorism financing, to law enforcement, border control issues, ICT and cyber, um, other types of new technologies such as biometrics and AI that are being increasingly used in the counterterrorism space, and the list goes on. And all of these measures across the CT spectrum have important gendered impacts, and more must be done to understand and analyze those impacts in order to incorporate them more effectively uh, into, um, into policy. Next slide, please. The second factor is that gender doesn't equal women. Um, a lot of programming in this area focuses predominantly not on gender, but on women, and specifically on women's participation. Um, again, a lot of this happens in the CVE space uh, with regard to women's civil society uh, organizations. Um, and some of it, of course, as, as Joanna also addressed in her presentation, uh, is about women's participation in law enforcement and the security sector more widely. And while this is certainly an important issue and presents uh, important opportunities, it also raises concerns that women are being instrumentalized, that their work is being securitized, and that CVE in some instances is seen as a substitute for uh, a more comprehensive women's rights agenda. But taking a gender perspective means more than just engaging women. Uh, the term gender is, is relational and it encompasses social, cultural, and economic power dynamics and structures. And focusing only on women provides an incomplete understanding of the wider structural factors and inequalities and how these relate to gender and how they produce violence and conflict. Um, in addition, terrorist groups themselves are extremely skillful at exploiting gender dynamics and gendered grievances. And they use ideas about femininity and masculinity in their narratives, in their recruitment strategies, and in their operational tactics. So this means that we also need to be looking at masculinities and men from a gender perspective and look at how gendered factors impact men's trajectories in and out of violent extremist groups. Um, and it is encouraging to see that there is more and more research devoted to issues around masculinity, and I think we will hear more about that in uh, some of the upcoming presentations. Um, but translating that focus on masculinities and translating a fuller understanding of gender inequality into policy on countering violent extremism will still require uh, a lot more work. Next slide, please. The third issue that I want to address is the lack of impact evaluations, good practices and guidance. Now, the lack of impact evaluations is a known challenge in PCVE in general, 
Uh, and it applies also specifically when it comes to gender sensitive policy and programming in PCVE, but also in, in the wider CT context. And when I talk about evaluating impact and, and effectiveness, um, I want to be very clear that that means evaluating programs as to whether they are human rights compliant, gender sensitive and sustainable. There is no trade off between that and effectiveness. In fact, the rights compliance of programs, including with regard to women's rights, is inseparable from their effectiveness. And having that evidence base that, that comes from systematic monitoring and evaluation is essential for being able to identify good practices and develop policy guidance um, and to be able to, to move past uh, the more generic, the more gener generic rhetoric um, that that simply affirms that gender matters and, and that measures need to be gender sensitive, but without further explaining what exactly that means. Um, and we still see a lot of, of, of that kind of more generic discourse. And this is something that is really uh, very striking to me in, in the dialogue that we have um, with, uh, with states on the implementation of counterterrorism measures. Um, we see that even in, in instances when a state is very much supportive and, and an advocate of the women, peace and security agenda, and specifically on integrating gender into counterterrorism, there are so sh huge shortfalls when it comes to domestic implementation of gender sensitive C uh, CT and CVE measures. And these shortfalls are directly linked to, um, to this, these elements that um, there is a struggle to identify what gender sensitive policies and programs should actually look like. And that if any such programs are put in place, that there is then not sufficient uh, monitoring and evaluation of their gender and human rights impact. And that means that there is then inadequate learning. So knowledge of how to actually design good policy in this space is still very much lacking. And um, I really cannot stress enough how important it is that we deepen the empirical evidence based on that. And that is something that is, that is fundamental in enabling us to improve policy implementation. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to turn to the impact of, of COVID-19. Um, there, um, there is a lot of analysis that has come out on the gendered implications of COVID-19. Uh, there's also a lot of discussion and analysis on the impact of COVID-19 on violent extremism. But so far, we've seen almost nothing on the intersection of the two. So on the impact of COVID-19 on the gendered aspects of violent extremism. Um, and as COVID-19 um, continues to, um, to exacerbate patterns of gender inequality and create gender grievances, it is essential for counterterrorism efforts to incorporate gender factors more effectively uh, into both analysis and response. And of course, we need to acknowledge that it will require more time to fully understand the, the mid and long-term implications of COVID-19, but nonetheless, it is important to make the point now that gender analysis must be included from the very outset and, and, and not at a later stage as, as an afterthought or, or add-on. Um, and I really hope that that is um, a lesson that we have learned from our experience with, uh, with ISIL, where we've seen that the failure to consider gender perspectives meant that the mobilization and, and travel of thousands of women from across the, the entire world caught us off guard and that subsequently states have struggled with the return of these women uh, and their children and have not been adequately prepared. And this is now having severe humanitarian as well as potential security consequences. Um, and even in, in terms of understanding ISIL itself and its vision of, of the so-called caliphate and, and the state building project that was attached to that, women had an important role in this vision and gender structures and gender hierarchies were an essential component of that society and, and that protest state that ISIL sought to create. So as we go forward, um, it is essential that we include gender analysis from the outset when looking at new trends and developments in the terrorism landscape. Um, that is something that is, that is important uh, to do when, as we continue our analysis of extreme right-wing terrorism, and it is something that I believe is also essential that we tackle when it comes to the issue of COVID-19. Um, very final point um, uh, from my side, still on, on the issue of COVID-19, I want to touch on the issue of, of resources, because um, we can, of course, expect that with the economic downturn resulting from the pandemic, uh, 
there will be a reallocation of, of funds and, and a shortage of funds that will also affect the counterterrorism and CBE space. Uh, and it will be crucial to ensure that gender does not fall by the wayside and that the gains that have been made are, are safeguarded. So that gender is, is not seen as, as optional. Um, it is, in fact, essential to everything that we do in counterterrorism, and it plays a critical role in ensuring that we do better in terms of making sure that, that our counterterrorism responses are rights compliant, that they are tailored to different individual needs and local contexts, uh, and that they are ultimately sustainable and effective. Um, and research has an important role to play in, in ensuring that we have the necessary evidence base to make the case for gender sensitive approaches and what those approaches should look like, uh, including with regards to the impact of COVID-19. So I will stop here um, and I very much look forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandra, in, indeed for, for this. Um, right, we're going to the next uh, speaker and the next speaker is Ashley. Uh, Mateus, and uh, as I mentioned, she's a PhD candidate in the Department of Communication at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and also a doctoral fellow with the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. Um, she explores in her work the use of online platforms to promote and mainstream extremist ideologies and divisive practices. Um, there she looks particularly through this courses predicated on gendered logics. Her research brings together cultural and media studies, um, feminist theory, and rhetoric to approach topics such as masculinities, online misogyny in the manosphere, and the linkages between the manosphere and the far or alt-right and alt-right women's discourses about negotiating submission and action and in extremist groups. Very much looking forward to Ashley's presentation. Over to you, Ashley. Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to be part of this event. I would like to express my thanks to the ICCT for coordinating this live briefing, as well as to my co-panelists for their excellent work and the audience for engaging in this discussion and, uh, about gender and violent extremism. My focus today is on the construction of ideal masculinity and online male supremacist cultures from the manosphere and the far right. I would like to note that my presentation includes imagery showing how these cultures construct ideal masculinity. Some of the images espouse hate and may be disturbing. While these online cultures narrate masculinity in relation to their goals and worldviews, their constructions of ideal masculinity share specific features, which makes studying them together useful for at least two reasons. First, better understanding how ideal masculinity is constructed within and across these cultures may tell us quite a bit about their interaction and impact. Second, consistency in ideals of masculinity across groups highlight the utility of gender as a strategic frame for spreading violent hate ideologies more broadly. Next slide, please. The manosphere is the popular term for a loose online community comprised of creators and consumers of misogynist and anti-feminist threads, blogs, social media accounts, and lifestyle websites. The far right online is comprised of a wide variety of ideological groupings predominantly focused on white racial supremacy. Examples include identitarian, white nationalist, nativist, and accelerationist variants. Importantly, these online cultures engage with gendered material and ideology that ranges from traditionalist right to extremist right in their orientations. Manosphere cultures are not explicitly racist, but originated in white Western contexts, with early adherents being predominantly white men in most groups. As a result, white norms are embedded in these ideologies but remain unmarked and obscured by notions of universal male experience. Next slide. The Manosphere includes four primary ideological cultures, men's rights activists or MRAs, men and women who focus on political critique and cultural wars activity online to dismantle feminism, men going their own way or MGTOWs, men who call for separatism from women and society with a goal of forcing social collapse and restructuring. Pickup artists or PUAs are typically young men who seek to actualize their masculinity by becoming alpha males uh, using the psychological strategy of game to conquer women sexually. And involuntary celibates or incels. These are young men who identify as celibate against their will or involuntarily deprived of sex. 
Incel forums spun off from PUA cultures in part because of the incel focus on an inability to attain the masculine ideal. These groups self-differentiate based on their specific orientation toward what they see as a world steeped in a gynocentric female supremacist culture that cares little for men. Next slide. The primary problem then, the reason the manosphere is necessary is male precarity. Men and masculinity, they claim, are under threat from widespread cultural misandry, the hatred of men, which is promoted by feminism. Far right online cultures articulate male precarity as a hallmark feature in racialized narratives of civilizational decline common to grand replacement theory. Whites and white culture are under threat from widespread anti-whiteness and specifically the hatred of white males promoted again by feminism. In both, or, excuse me, next slide, please. In both framings, the crux of the threat comes from feminism's liberation of women's sexual and socio-political choice. In these narrations, allowing women to choose sexual partners, to work outside the home, and to vote has destroyed the correct natural social order, and society will collapse if feminism isn't stopped. In addition, both online cultures' ideologies are rooted in governmental conspiracies. Next slide, please. For manosphere groups, it is the global gynocentric governance, um, and for far-right groups, it is the Zog, or Zionist occupied government, each of which use feminism as an instrument of white male destruction. Thus, these online cultures overlap in their rhetorical framing of an existential threat and the generation of in and out groups using highly resonant narratives of masculine precarity and virulent anti-feminism. This overlap has allowed for interaction between these ideologies and the movement of adherence between groups. For example, former MRAs such as Stefan Molyneux and Christopher Cantwell transitioning into alt-right cultures. There is also now ideological admixture between these cultures' visual rhetoric, most notably meme production that inserts far-right ideology into manosphere visuals. Next slide. In this image, MGTOW ideology is posed as a tool of the Zog to further white genocide by promoting the exit of white men from sexual relations and therefore reproduction with white women. Next slide, please. And in this image, which belongs to a series of meme using incel visual rhetoric of virgins versus chads uh, to assert that racially motivated mass violence provides a pathway to proper masculinity. Such interactions leverage gendered ideology, particularly debates over correct masculinity as a framework for spreading racial hate. Next slide, please. These groups, broadly speaking, frame gender as biological, binary, universal, and heterosexual. Here, gender and biological sex are conflated and heterosexual desire is framed through notions of biological and psychological sexual imperatives. This arrangement is then framed as universal, something all people share, regardless of history, culture, or other social factors. In this way, white Western heteronormative ideals of masculinity and femininity become fixed. Any discourse outside of this framing is then posed as deviant and used to support claims that attempts to change gender roles inevitably results in social confusion and negative reactions, even violence, as people and men in particular try to survive in an unnatural social order. This logic also feeds narratives of cultural Marxism as promoted by social justice warriors and affects a crucial rhetorical reference across these online cultures for outgroup antagonism and in-group affiliation. Within this understanding of gender, common features of ideal masculinity include rationality, independence, strength, and control. Such characteristics are common to normative Western cultural constructions of masculinity but become extreme when they are used to articulate masculinity as both victim and savior in relation to existential threat. Next slide, please. Rationality is narrated as a basis for white male socio-political superiority and control through a frame of benevolent paternalism, where rational men have a duty to care for and protect women, children, and to some extent, lesser men. Notions of white men's natural orientation for rational leadership leverage stereotypes about women and non-white people to position male or white socio-political dominance as a solution to the problems of modernity. 
Next slide, please. Physical strength is seen as an essential biological trait of men and as a differentiator of men from women. This physical strength is the basis of men's provider and protector role, and in conjunction with rationality, acts as an embodied manifestation of white men's superior capacity for leadership. Strength is also seen as a necessary predicate for successful sexual relations. As these cultures argue, dominant masculinity is what women innately desire. Next slide, please. Independence in this frame is a relationality between supposedly real men. Here, women, children, and non-white men are incapable of fully being independent. This characteristic is often framed implicitly through narrations of female and non-white dependence. Misogynistic tropes include supposedly independent women or single mothers who replace male partners with government welfare. And racialized tropes often assert immigrants and refugees invade Western countries to access the benefits of government welfare. Next slide, please. Control as a facet of masculinity includes both self-control and being able to assert control over other naturally weaker individuals or groups. It is this aspect of the construction of masculinity through which motivating fantasies of dominance can be engaged as a natural, even biological capacity of white men. Posed as protective, violence is framed as both rational and appropriate. Such protective violence is then the flip side of benevolent paternalism, and both are framed as corrective forms of masculine care. Crucially, the shift between benevolence and violence is framed as dependent on external stimuli, like women and non-whites who won't accept their place. This externalization works narratively to ameliorate responsibility for such violence. In this way, white male violence is transposed into a natural, even caring response to non-whiteness and womanhood run amok. Analyzing ideal constructions of gender, particularly masculinity, is essential for better understanding extremist violence. In cases of mass attackers originating from far-right online ideologies, attacker documentation positions their attacks through a frame of asserting control via protective violence. Many attackers articulate fears of replacement as a basis for protecting both white women and white culture, including the attacks in Norway in 2011, Charleston, South Carolina in 2015, and El Paso, Texas in 2019, among others. The Christchurch attacker articulated the need to protect white women as a push factor in the attack, specifically citing the death of Ebba Ackerland in a Stockholm, Sweden uh, terror attack in 2017 as the first event that pushed him down the path of violence. However, unlike far-right attacks, incel mass attacks did not use this framing of control through protective violence, likely because they do not see themselves as capable of achieving the masculine ideal. Instead, the Isla Vista shooter and the Toronto van attacker used a frame of retribution and articulated a desire to die during the attack. Given that suicide is a more prominent strand of discussion than mass violence within incel cultures, better understandings of the push-pull factors from self-harm to harming others is necessary. This difference in framing violence is an important distinction between the two types of attacker's reasoning that is directly related to ideal masculinity and as such requires more research, work that is only just beginning. Next slide, please. In closing, I would like to make one last but very important distinction between ideology and practice. Gendered ideals are constructed as rigid and inflexible. In practice, however, people mobilize these ideals in fluid ways. Recent ethnographic research by Dr. Elizabeth Pearson shows that gendered ideals and embodied practice differ in multiple ways in her analysis of extremists in the UK. This research highlights the need to explore gaps between gendered ideological constructions and lived practice as such gaps might prove productive avenues for practitioners as well as researchers. Thank you so much and I look forward to your questions. Many thanks indeed, um, Ashley. And as the final panelist, we have now um, Dr. Yannick Rieu-Lepage, who is an assistant professor at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University. His research interests include the creation of online narratives and propaganda, which fosters or normalizes terrorism, historical antecedents to terrorism, far-right extremism, and the transnational link 
of far right groups and ideological and technical diffusion the applica and the application of evolutionary theory to social science. Um, Yannick, over to you for the final presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much, Joachim. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Cook, along with the, the staff at ICCT, uh, for this invitation. Um, I'm not sure why that slide is not completely loaded, uh, but one of the important thing on the slide which is missing is the fact that this, uh, this presentation or the research I'm going to talk about uh, today is research I've done in collaboration with a brilliant PhD student at Georgia State, that's Aisha uh, Maniglu. So I think her, her uh, contribution here is important to be recognized. At the same time, I also want to recognize uh, the funders uh, of two grants that have straddled uh, this project and just put a quick disclaimer that the opinions and the findings uh, of this presentation don't necessarily represent those of uh, the funders. Next slide, please. So essentially, this research comes from uh, an observation that historically both the extreme right movement and the, jihad the jihadi Salafist movement have been characterized by an extreme sexism and misogyny. Uh, we see them in the ex we see this in the extreme right, for example, uh, within the embodiment of uh, the Proud Boys, uh, but also through uh, the practice uh, of the Islamic State when we're looking at jihadi Salafist uh, movements. But counterintuitively, at the same time, we've seen that women have been heavily involved within this movement, both at an operational, at a tactical, and at a strategic role. And what we decided to do for this research is dive in a bit more at the role of women within women-only platforms online. So if we can switch uh, slides again. And essentially what we kind of wanted to understand was what is the role of women in the digital extremist uh, space? And we did so by ex examining two women-only forums. And we had three guiding questions. This is where I'm going to speak a bit today and hopefully provide uh, some preliminary answers on this. So firstly, we were interested in understanding what would be the salient themes or topic in extreme right and Islamic State women-only forums. So I'm talking about online forums, which are where the participants are, are limited um, uh, to women. The second question that we had is, what is the difference or the similarities? Are we going to see anything that's going to be similar? Or are we going to see striking differences um, based, on, based on ideology, for example? Uh, between these, these forums. And lastly, we were interested in understanding what is the role of ideology within uh, these particular forums. So if we could move on to, to the next slide again. So while this loads, all right, so essentially what we decided to do is we identified two particular platforms. This first one is one that I think most people will be familiar with. Uh, Stormfront. Stormfront is a hate site. It's essentially the original white nationalist uh, online space. It was created in 1996 uh, in order to, to facilitate David's Duke uh, electoral uh, campaign. And one of the things behind Stormfront, how it works stuff, is that it has a multiple of, uh, of discussion groups. And these discussion groups or these discussion forums uh, will range on topics. So some of them will be on white supremacy, uh, other will be on theology, on religion, on science. Um, there's also regionally specific forums and linguistical specific forums. So you can find a forum in Stormfront for Canada, and then you can find a sub forum on Stormfront for Quebec, so French speaking part uh, of Canada. Within this, uh, within Stormfront, there is a sub forum called, uh, which is a women's only sub forum. This is the, the, the platform that we decided to investigate. The other platform is Telegram. So Telegram is a messaging application and it's got an open API. Uh, it's heavily encrypted in the sense that it's got a peer-to-peer uh, -peer encryption um, uh, platform. Uh, but at the time when we were conducted this research, it was by far the preferred uh, platform by the Islamic State. Uh, it was used both as a mean of disseminating official uh, propaganda, but also by sympathizers of the Islamic State in order to correspond 
and, and chat uh, with each other. So in, in many ways, quite interesting as well. And there's selection of, of platforms. One of them, Stormfront, is a kind of an old school uh, extremist space online, whereas uh, Telegram in itself is rather new um, in itself. All right, next, uh, next slide, please. So in order to, to analyze the Stormfront platform, uh, we acquired data from Southern Poverty Law Center. And what they did is they provided us data that was collected from a 14 year period. So from 2001 to 2015. And this is quite important to our research because Stormfront has been closed on several occasions uh, as, uh, as domain uh, hosting uh, sites essentially have canceled their, um, their account and a lot of data has been lost. Whereas our data set was quite uh, was quite complete as a result of that 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 uh, partnership, um, so we've collected the threads that were part of the women's forum. It's a total of thirty five thousand uh, posts and about a thousand eight hundred uh, threads. And what was quite interesting is that we saw kind of global participation. So they, while all the posts are in English, um, by doing kind of deep dive, we saw that there was people from essentially all over the world. Going on to the next slide, um, the data collection for the Islamic State came from a chat room called Women Dawa. Uh, this was collected during a period of one year, so between June 2017 to June 2018. And this was quite a, a large task that Aisha took on hand that involved her signing on to that, uh, to that chat room every day for, for a period of a year and taking screenshots of every single conversation uh, that took place because we didn't have a, a digital scraper that was uh, that was created in order to do that uh, automatically. So here we're looking at about 21,000, uh, 2,100 of, uh, um, uh, sorry, we're looking at about 7,000 messages. Uh, all these were in Turkish, so they were eventually translated uh, by Aisha into, into English. Now going on to the next slide, the methodology that we employed is an unsupervised machine learning uh, approach, uh, LDA. And essentially what it does is that it looks for themes within large bodies of text. So in the example that's on the screen right now, we see a review uh, that was left in a car dealership. And essentially what the, the algorithm does, is that it's able to identify a particular theme. So the first one has to do uh, with cars itself. So you see car, vehicle, finances. The second theme that's being, um, that was being identified had to do with collection. So collection, agency, recovery, and lastly with correspondence, uh, letters received, sent. So this essentially allows us to process a large amount of data very, very quickly. As well as doing this, we also did a random sampling of posts in order to do a, a deeper kind of content analysis uh, in order to understand the salient themes. So let's go to the next slide and see uh, what the kind of main themes that we say came out uh, from both uh, from both the Women's Forum and the Women's uh, DAWA data set. So one of the things that kind of struck us immediately was the similarity and the crossover between uh, both data sets and similar or, or themes that are topics that are recurring in both data sets are identified uh, with an asterisk. So we see ideology, pregnancy, appearance, family, relationship, form rules, and violence. Um, a couple of kind of striking things as well here that we see is that the topic of, of religion, um, which we did separate from ideology uh, in the sense that these were within the women's dawa. Uh, a data set, and then we're talking about religion itself, so interpretation of religion and religious uh, debates. Now, one of the other findings that, that came out of this, if we can move to the next slide, has to do with the strong enforcement of group memberships within uh, both of these forums. Uh, so one of the things that we saw, a recurring theme within um, uh, the Stormfront uh, data set was this kind of ongoing moderation that uh, the moderators of this, uh, of this uh, women's only space had to do. So constantly calling out individuals 
uh, that, that were known to be, uh, known to be male, um, either because they're known on the side or they identified as such in their posts and essentially telling them to knock it off, telling them to get out of this space, that they have the rest of the site that they can interact with, this space itself is reserved uh, for women. We saw something quite similar happening within, uh, within Telegram. Uh, we saw that uh, there was a, a strict separation of gender that took place uh, within the forum. We've done a couple of experiments where uh, we changed the, uh, the account names to reflect a particular, uh, particular gender of a user and then see how long uh, or see what action took place. And we saw that we were quickly booted or removed uh, from, uh, from the space as a result if we tried to log into uh, Women's Dawa using a, a username that seemed to identify that the, uh, the user would be male. So that's kind of the first interesting finding that we saw of this, that the, the space, while they are, that there is a certain amount of enforcement that takes place within the space itself. The second kind of neat finding that came out of our, of our study, if we can move to the next slide, has to do with the role of, um, the role of ideology within, uh, within both, uh, within both uh, platforms. So on stormfrom.com, uh, there was a lot less discussion about the movement itself. Uh, although ideological discussion were kind of interweaved throughout the, the conversation. And here's an example of this uh, where someone is talking about uh, their love life and, and essentially their difficulty in, in finding uh, a good uh, white nationalist uh, male. So if, if you read the post, I, I, won't have, I won't go through it exactly, but even you can see how ideology is interweaved with this uh, by the end saying uh, complete with uh, with David Lane memorial tattoo, David Lane, which is an about uh, racist and coded uh, the 14 words. Woman Dawa, we saw that there was much more conversations about ideology. And one of the, the reasons for this that we believe is that because there's strict gender segregation within the ISIS digital sphere, this was probably one of the only space uh, where women sympathizer to the Islamic state could have these, these debates which also meant that Women's Dawa was, was much more responsive uh, to sailing events and had these much more uh, overt uh, discussion. And then lastly, if we'll move to the last um, finding, and I think this in many ways is the finding that is the most important, and particularly I think the most important as far as a practitioner focus, is the fact that these online space served as peer support network. The majority of the conversations that we saw didn't necessarily or didn't link to ideology, uh, but instead these space were essentially treated as a place where people could seek like-minded individuals and have conversations about kind of everyday concerns. So the most popular uh, thread on, on Stormfront, for example, uh, within the women's uh, subforum, was uh, the pregnant trying to conceive thread where essentially people talk about uh, their, their effort to, to make a family. And the reason why I think this is particularly important from a practitioner point of view is that it gives us an idea of the role of these online space. It essentially allows people to create a particular important peer network. And if we're talking about um, off-ramping, if we're talking about kind of de-radicalization, uh, de we also have to think about removing people from that space and what's gonna come in uh, in order to, to replace that lost social network for individuals that we're trying to, to off ramp. So I don't wanna take too, too much time, uh, but just kind of in closing in the next slide, just to say that this is still preliminary research. We've got one paper that have, has come out of this, but we're continuing to, uh, to uh, focus on this research. We're hopefully going to do comparisons looking at different groups within each movement, but also look at whether uh, the topic and style and volume uh, of speech of women within uh, particularly Stormfront changes when they are posting across gendered forum uh, versus when they're posting on the women's only forum. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Yannick. And indeed, thank you to, to all the panelists, um, Joanna, Ashley, Alexandra.
uh, and Yannick for, for giving uh, comprehensive overviews over the different perspectives on gender and extremism uh, uh, and also a kind of policy and uh, practice dimension to this entire discussion. So your questions have been uh, trickling in and that is great. Thank you so much again. And again, it's, it's great to see so much uh, interest from uh, such a wide audience of participants. Um, I will now try to uh, group them a, uh, a little bit and we will hopefully be able in the next uh, remaining 24 minutes to cover as much ground um, as possible. So kicking off with the first question, um, why is, and this is a question uh, from Steve Hewitt from the University of Birmingham, thanks for that question, why is masculinity or masculinity so often left out of discussions around gender and violent extremism? In particular, isn't there room for examining, examining masculinity as an important variable within far-right extremism? Uh, so if I could ask maybe Ashley and then Joanna to um, give their thoughts on this question. Uh, yes, so why is masculinity left out of the study? Um, that has to do a lot with existing gendered assumptions and biases as well as norms in how we ask questions in research and how we think about this. Um, gender, as Alexandra mentioned, often equals women in how we think about and look at the world. Um, we, we use gender as a differentiator to mean not men. Um, and in part, because we don't expect women to be violent, that's one of our gendered biases. We don't expect women to agree with violence. They're supposed to be caring and emotional, right? But we do assume that men can and will be violent, right? So in the case of women, they're spectacular. It's, it's something we want to look at because it's different from our assumption. But with men, we, we kind of think we already know what the reasoning is there. So it doesn't seem to be so necessary. Um, I'm doing this work on masculinities as are quite a few other scholars, a lot of younger female scholars. I happen to also be a fellow with the newly researcher created um, Institute for Research on Male Supremacism, that every scholar involved in that looks at male supremacy and masculinities in, in the frame of gender and how that relates to violent extremism in these online cultures. So Manosphere, uh, far and alt-right, incels, things like that. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. I agree with every point that Ashley made. And I know that even from my own research, anytime, you know, from the beginning of my PhD and onwards for the last, you know, eight years now, when you say gender, it's still consistently associated with women. And so particularly when uh, when I was speaking with practitioner audiences, it, it didn't quite resonate with them. But as soon as you'd say the word gender, people would tend to kind of fall asleep. And so I think, uh, you know, as a researcher for me personally, one of the things I really try and do is uh, demonstrate very clearly why that lens, that gender lens is useful uh, for researchers, for practitioners, the, the practical utility of it. And so as a researcher, I think it is up to us as well to demonstrate the value, the utility and the insights that that full gender lens uh, can offer for, uh, for understanding not only the roles of women in these groups, but the roles of men and the intersecting uh, kind of gender dynamics within those as well. So it's a great question though. Um, and just to kind of follow up very quickly, um, when I mentioned that gender ideals are, bi are, are binary construction in these groups in terms of ideology, how men are constructed through the ideal also tells you how women are constructed and vice versa, right? Constructing one constructs the other because there's only two and one is what the other one is not, right? So as we think about that, if we're thinking about um, them using these narratives to promote radicalization and violence, there is a reason they're using them, right? And, and so that makes them essential to the study of understanding both radicalization and violent acts. Thank you very much. And maybe staying on, on, on this topic, um, Ashley, um, there's one other question um, direct, uh, no? yeah, uh, directly addressed to you. Um, and this comes from, uh, oh no, there's unfortunately no uh, information on who asked the question, but it's a great question. How do women in the far right rationalize the different manosphere narratives within their own participation in the far right? Do they naturally accept their role as subjects that need to be protected? Do they equally support the claim that there is an attack on... So do they have a role in protecting that 
proper manhood. So in answering this question, um, I want to point to my closing on the difference between practice and ideology, right? So when women narrate this from an ideological perspective, um, in fact, I have a paper, Shield Maidens of Whiteness, Alt-Maternalism and Women Recruiting for the Far and Alt-Right, which the link to that, it's open access, the link will come out in the follow-up email, um, that describes this in detail. When women discuss it ideologically, they do argue that they accept their gendered role, that not only do they accept it, it's what they want, it's what they desire, and feminism is taking it from them, right? And so restoring this means that they get to be real women again. Um, that is actually also their role in protecting these groups, right? Is to become a real woman, be traditional, um, have children, support their husbands, do that labor, do that work, the care work. Um, now, they also have to narrate how they're active, right? Because they're also recruiting. So they have frameworks for negotiating an active role while agreeing to this kind of ideological point, which revolve around things like presenting uh, what I would call women of myth and legend. So the shield maiden figure, it's okay for women to participate in an active way in certain circumstances in order to protect from emergent situations or emergent problems, threats. Um, they do equally support the claim often that men <laughs> and male precarity, men are under threat and male precarity exists and as a basis for white supremacy as well. So that's from the ideological perspective, how that actually happens in practice. And again, I'll point to Dr. Uh, Pearson's work in a very recent paper on studies on conflict and terrorism, um, where she actually goes through the nuance of how that's talked about versus how people do things in the real world that don't line up with that ideal, right? And still maneuver within these groups. So making those distinctions is really important. Um, and women, even women who openly claim to support this are not protected from misogyny and trolling by men in these groups and in this wider culture. It's another point I use in the framing of my paper. So I would definitely point you to my Shield Maidens paper in terms of looking at how that's narrated, but I would point you to work like Dr. Pearson's for looking at how that then plays out in the real world. Thank you very much. Um, question for um, both Alexandra and uh, Joanna. It was mentioned that a gendered perspective is highly relevant not only in uh, CVE, but also C um, sorry, in, uh, country in violent extremism, but also in counterterrorism, including law enforcement, border controls, and so on. Can you give some concrete examples of this? This question was asked by uh, Serhant Led. I hope I pronounce this correctly. Um, starting off maybe with Alexandra first. Sure, thanks for that question. Yeah, I think uh, there are so many different ways and, and dimensions in which uh, gender comes into the full uh, counterterrorism uh, spectrum, both as it sort of addresses uh, women uh, in terms of, uh, you know, or is directed at women in, in their roles as um, actors involved in violent extremism and terrorism, uh, in terms of how it, uh, how different measures have an effect on, um, on women more widely, but this gendered impact of counterterrorism measures that, that I referred to, uh, as well as, of course, the roles of, of women uh, within uh, the counterterrorism uh, space, um, uh, something that, that Joanna talked about extensively. But so uh, let me perhaps just pick a couple of very specific examples in, uh, in the areas uh, that were referred to by, uh, by your person asked the question. So um, in uh, very, very concretely in border control, um, we need to make sure that we have uh, gender sensitive border screenings, right? So that uh, both in, in, in terms of being able to, uh, to identify uh, women who travel with the objective of, of joining a, a terrorist group, uh, that we're able to identify them, but that we're also able to screen them in a, in a way that uh, complies with, uh, with their rights. Um, it is essential that that type of screening is that there is training also to make sure that, uh, for example, signs of human trafficking are being spotted in that context uh, in cases where that cross-border travel is not voluntary. Uh, so uh, many elements around, around that issue would, would be a concrete example. Uh, in the space of criminal justice that I mentioned, 
uh, prosecution is is a huge issue, uh, and we're seeing uh, we are seeing a lot of challenges in terms of uh, translating the findings that we have from research when it comes to the different roles that women play within violent extremist groups. Uh, and uh, translating those findings into then an understanding of what does that mean for how we prosecute women for their roles in, in those violent extremist groups. Uh, so that uh, requires an understanding of the roles that they play, potential acts that they may have uh, committed or not, the degree of agency that they've had in playing these roles, which relates directly to the level of criminal responsibility that they have, right? Um, and so, and, and we are seeing, uh, I'm actually in the process of, of doing some analysis on, on that issue specifically, and we're seeing huge discrepancies in terms of how uh, national criminal justice systems are dealing with, with these issues, with the full spectrum from, uh, you know, a, a very gender biased view of, of women as purely passive victims, to uh, two instances where uh, their violence is being um, is being uh, particularly vilified because it is seen a as a transgression of gender norms, um, and so um, so there is a lot in in, in that space that, that needs to be uh, uh, unpacked. So uh, just a few concrete examples from from my side. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah, those are really great examples, and, and as. Uh, as the question was being asked, I just jotted down a couple others that came to mind. But I think if you're working in law enforcement, a gender perspective could inform things like uh, how or why do people have certain pathways into or motivations to join a group? So those can be slightly distinct for men and women and discuss kind of the spaces and places from which they're getting recruited and how they join a group and under what circumstances. Uh, how the roles in an organization might change over time. So, for example, if you see increased operational pressure on an organization, as we saw with example uh, ISIS and, and Mosul, uh, as the city was being retaken, it was only at that point that they really started deploying female suicide bombers at, uh, in, in large numbers. And so that was, uh, again, kind of the operational pressure on them and thinking about that through, uh, through a gender lens as well. How do we support people when they're departing a group? And how do we, uh, how do uh, their gender impact considerations in terms of reintegration? If they have children, if they're uh, if they're single, if they're married, if they've got families, uh, gender lens kind of helps inform all of these things in terms of people leaving a group behind as well. Uh, the great point on border security as well. In many cases, women are not viewed as a threat, so they're not searched as frequently. Um, but the idea of just doing no harm, so ensuring that any of the actions you take in law enforcement do not inadvertently cause harm to the citizens for which you are to be protecting. Uh, one of the things that became quite interesting to me looking at the, the case of Yemen as well is uh, the number of drone strikes that were conducted in the country to, care, uh, to kill uh, Al-Qaeda figures. And one of the things that was never really discussed, uh, we're, we're talking over 1,300 individuals killed by drone strikes in Yemen, uh, well over that I believe now. But the average family in Yemen has about six children, seven children in rural settings. And the idea that the, uh, the widows and the children that were being left behind, some of these were being directly recruited from and supported by Al-Qaeda. We saw similar uh, steps being taken by insurgent groups and terrorist groups in Iraq and Afghanistan as well. So what a, a gender lens can offer to us is not only the primary impact, but secondary and tertiary impacts of our counterterrorism actions. And really think about, you know, if we're taking that step in counterterrorism work, what are some of the implications that might come off from that? And how can we prevent those kind of secondary and tertiary impacts that could really impact uh, you know, different members of family or genders in different ways as well? Thank you very much for this. Um, uh, Alexandra, there's uh, also another question that uh, was directed uh, towards you directly about discourse analysis, narrative research. So again, this kind of uh, intersection between policy and research. Uh, the question by, asked by Azima and Chima from Pakistan, what can you say about the quality of discourse analysis and narrative research currently deployed for policy use in countering violent extremism or uh, PVE in the UN system? We feel both the policy language and diagnostic methods are reinforcing female exclusion and uh, there is a need for a serious review. Okay. Um, thanks for, for that question. Um, I think when it comes to um, um, to that uh, to to analysis and and research uh, on this, I mean I can only speak for for my office at CTED. We have very extensive engagement uh, with the research community um, and uh, look at um, 
at different approaches and, and perspectives to, to, um, to, to analysis in, in this space. Um, and I think uh, what I want to highlight is that this is an area that still very much continues to evolve, both on the, on the research side as well as on the practice side. And so we continue to gain new insights that then allow us to, uh, in fact, review existing policies and practices uh, and, and hopefully improve them. And, um, and I hope that sort of in my remarks, I uh, made clear that there are certain areas that I see as, as real priorities in that regard, where we do need uh, both better research, uh, but also we, we need or more research, uh, because that is a fundamental evidence base for us on the policy side to make sure we can, we ta can take those findings into consideration and, and develop uh, then better, uh, better and more effective uh, approaches. So, um, so I think uh, this is something that is still continues to continues very much to uh, to evolve and and deepen our understanding of the of the very different gender dynamics uh, that uh, that are at play in the in the counterterrorism space. Thank you very much. And while I have you uh, um, answering a uh, uh, final question was um, whether you could expand on the gap of analysis on the influence of COVID nineteen on the gendered aspects of violent extremism. Uh, where could one start examining this intersection uh, and have you already identified some of those examples? That sounds to me like someone is interested in researching this further. Uh, which would be very welcome. <laughs> so um, yes, I think when it comes to, uh, to that impact, um, of COVID-19, I think um, I think of it again uh, in terms of, of the two sides in relation to violent extremism itself, and in relation to uh, to the response, um, so to to countering violent extremism and countering terrorism. So, in relation to violent extremism itself, um, I mean, starting with with a very basic fact that COVID-19 is exacerbating patterns of gender inequality. We, we are already seeing that uh, in, in a number of ways. Um, and we know that gender inequality correlates with an increased likelihood of, of violence and conflict. And so uh, that would be one potential starting point to, to look into, into further and, and to see how, how those dynamics continue, uh, continue to, uh, to evolve as this pandemic progresses and as it, it, it's, um, its various effects are being felt more deeply across you know the socioeconomic space uh, and and not just in terms of its its immediate health impact um so uh, so there is that side on the other side in terms of uh, in relation to to the response i think uh, what we have seen in many cases is uh the use of emergency measures, many of which also come from counterterrorism legislation that has been put in place, that is now being used to, to address uh, the, uh, the situation um, uh, with regards to the pandemic. Uh, we know that many of these measures, again, have a disproportionate and gendered impact of, uh, on women, uh, on women civil society groups, on women human rights defenders, um, and the, many of the restrictions that are being put in place. Uh, are being felt by them particularly strongly. Uh, so that is, uh, that is another issue to, uh, to look into, uh, as well as uh, in the sort of mid and longer term, the, uh, the fact that um, uh, the factor that I mentioned when it comes to uh, allocation of, of resources and uh, are we in uh, a situation in which we will be facing uh, very serious budgetary shortfalls, are we going to continue our commitment to making sure that gender sensitive counterterrorism measures are being prioritized and, and uh, that uh, there is funding available for, uh, for the work that women's civil society organizations are doing in that space and so forth. So uh, there really are, are many dimensions uh, to, uh, to be looked at. Thank you very much. Um, Yannick, uh, there are a couple of questions um, that, and I see we have six minutes left and we have to have a hard stop um, addressed to you. And that is one uh, is what ideas exist to get women off of uh, the peer supports websites that you've uh, mentioned from uh, Anium Ali. And the second question, maybe if we can group that already for you, is um, when, you, when you talked about policing the forums, who was actually tasked with policing the fora? Uh, were it members of was it members of external 
was it members or external figures, uh, i.e. men? And this is a question from Cathal McManus from Queen's University, Belfast. So the forums are policed uh, internally. Uh, for Stormfront, we're fairly confident that the, the main uh, moderator is a woman. Uh, and I'm saying this because we were able to identify all her posts and go through about 10 years of posting history. And there's never anything that makes us think that it's a sock puppet account or anything like that. Um, so, so the Stormfront forum, the, the, uh, the women's sub forum is, seems to be moderated by women uh, members. Uh, Telegram is a lot harder to kind of to, to do this type of identification. Um, we assume that again, it is, it is women uh, members that are moderating that particular forum, but that is simply kind of a, a gut assumption that because of the, the way Telegram work, because of the way the platform work, it, it's a lot harder to kind of do this kind of nitty gritty analysis. As far as kind of getting people off uh, uh, these forums, I think the, the point I'm trying to make is something that uh, Richard English does in his last book, uh, Does Terrorism Work, where he essentially talks about individual motivation for joining an extremist organization. And he brings forward the concept of inherent rewards. Uh, which is something that is separated from the ideological and the cause itself, essentially something that an individual will gain by being part of a particular group. And as we're going kind of through all of these posts, we're seeing these inherent reward, which is in the form of this particular network. And I think this is particularly important because if we start reading things uh, about former people that are active in, in real life, if you want, as opposed to online, that eventually leave the far right movement, one of the kind of recurring themes that we see is this kind of sense of being abandoned afterwards, of lacking these social structures, lacking these peer networks uh, that were quite important for them. And it, kind of what we're seeing here is that we're seeing that these peer networks that are quite important in keeping somebody in the movement, or at least are very important as a form of inherent reward for being part of the movement, also seem to be very act, uh, very present. Uh, online. And this isn't specific uh, to women. The same thing happens uh, for, for, for male members of Stormfront, for example, if you kind of go through their post history, a lot of it doesn't only do or doesn't only deal with ideology, but they also talk about relationship, they'll talk about hockey, they'll talk about sports, they'll talk about cars, they'll ask advice on how to, you know, fix something or things like that. But it's essentially, it's, it, I do think it's important that when we're talking about de-radicalization, it's not only about changing people's ideas, or if, if that's your view of de-radicalization, but we also need to recognize that there's a social, uh, that, that, that these sites, that these movements serve a particular social function for these individuals. And if you only go, for example, with counter messaging, you are omitting a large part uh, of the equation. And that's kind of the point that I was trying to, to bring across here. Thank you very much, uh, Yannick. Um, there are a, a variety of questions still coming in, but I'm, I'm afraid to say that the time is, is up. We have to uh, finish with a hard stop at 5.30. But I would like really to thank um, all four panelists for um, uh, excellent uh, contributions, also to uh, extensive um, answers to these, these variety of questions. would also like to thank ICT for organizing this. Uh, Antoinette van den Berg also behind the scenes uh, doing a lot in uh, organizing this. Um, also, as another Reichenbach and um, uh, her colleagues. Uh, so, so, sorry, and uh, Davila um, Namis. Uh, I would also encourage you to go to the website of ICCT um, or the Institute of Security and Global Affairs for further publications on these topics. Um, also, we will also um, put up uh, links to this um, uh, event and further upcoming events. Once again, thank you very much for coming in such great numbers. We had over 200 participants. Uh, thank you to all for, uh, for particip participants and also for uh, Joanna for co-organizing this event. Many thanks. Thank you.